think you're looking through a window at a dolphin spinning playfully. But what you're actually looking through is a two-way mirror at a dolphin looking at itself spinning playfully. This is a dolphin that is self-aware. This dolphin has self-awareness. It's a young dolphin named Bailey. I've been very interested in understanding the nature of the intelligence of dolphins for the past 30 years. How do we explore intelligence in this animal that's so different from us? And what I've used is a very simple research tool, a mirror, and we've gained great information, reflections of these animal minds. Dolphins aren't the only animals, the only non-human animals, to show mere self-recognition. We used to think this was a uniquely human ability, but we learned that the great apes, our closest relatives, also showed this ability. Then we showed it in dolphins, and then later in elephants. We did this work in my lab with the dolphins and elephants, and it's been recently shown in the magpie. Now, it's interesting because we've embraced this Darwinian view of the continuity in physical evolution, this physical continuity, but we've been much more reticent, much slower at recognizing this continuity in cognition, in emotion, in consciousness in other animals. Other animals are conscious, they're emotional, they're aware. There have been multitudes of studies with many species over the years that have given us exquisite evidence for thinking and consciousness in other animals, other animals that are quite different than we are in form. We are not alone. We are not alone in these abilities. And I hope, and my, one of my biggest dreams, is that with our growing awareness about the consciousness of others and our relationship with the rest of the animal world, that we'll give them the respect and protection that they deserve. So that'll, that's a wish I'm throwing out here for everybody, and I hope you, uh, can, I can really engage you in this idea. Now, I want to return to dolphins, because these are the animals that I'm, I feel like I've been working up closely and personal with for over 30 years. And these are real personalities. They are not persons, but they're personalities in every sense of the word. And you can't get more alien than the dolphin. They're very different from us in body form. They're radically different. They come from a radically different environment. In fact, we're separated by 95 million years of divergent evolution. Look at this body. These, in, and with, in every sense of making a pun here, these are true non-terrestrials. I wondered how we might interface with these animals. In the 1980s, I developed an underwater keyboard. This was a custom-made touchscreen keyboard. What I wanted to do is give the dolphins choice and control. These are big brains, highly social animals. And I thought, well, if we give them choice and control, if they can hit a symbol on this keyboard, and by the way, it was interfaced by fiber optic cables from Hewlett Packard with an Apple II computer. This seems prehistoric now, but this was where we were with technology. So the dolphins could hit a key, a symbol, they heard a computer-generated whistle, and they got an object or activity. Now, here's a little video. This is Delphi and Pan, and you're going to see Delphi hitting a key. He hears a computer-generated whistle and gets a ball. So they can actually ask for things they want. What was remarkable is they explored this keyboard on their own. We did, we, there was no intervention on our part. They explored the keyboard, they played around with it, they figured out how it worked, and they started to quickly imitate the sounds that all, the, the keyboard they were hearing on the keyboard. They imitated on their own. Beyond that, though, they started learning associations between the symbols, the sounds, and the, and the objects. What we saw was self-organized learning, and now, I'm imagining what can we do with new technologies? How can we create interfaces, new windows into the minds of animals with the technologies that exist today? So I was thinking about this, and then one day I got a call from Peter. <clears throat> I make noises for a living on a good day. It's music, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the most amazing music-making experience I ever had. Uh, I'm a farm boy, I grew up surrounded by animals, and I would look in these eyes and wonder what was going on there. So as an adult, when I started to read about the amazing breakthroughs with Penny Patterson and Coco, with Sue Savage-Rambo, and Kanzi Pambanisha, Irene Pepperberg, Alex the Parrot, I got all excited. What was amazing to me also was 
they seemed a lot more adept at getting a handle on our language than we were on getting a handle on theirs. I work with a lot of musicians from around the world and often we don't have any common language at all. But we sit down behind our instruments and suddenly there's a way for us to connect and emote. So I started cold calling and eventually got through to Sue Savage Rambo and she invited me down. I went down and uh, the bonobos had had access to percussion instruments, musical toys, but never before to a keyboard. At first they did what infants do, just bashed it with their fists and then I asked through Sue if Pam Benicia could try with one finger only. So groom was the subject of the uh, of the piece. So I'm just behind jamming. Yeah, this is what we started with. Sue's encouraging her to continue a little more. Good. So that night we began to dream and we thought perhaps the most amazing tool that man's created is the internet and what would happen if we could somehow find new interfaces, visual audio interfaces that would allow these remarkable sentient beings that we share the planet with access and Sue Savage Rambo got excited about that, called her friend Steve Woodruff and we began hustling all sorts of people whose work related or was inspiring, uh, which led us to Diana and led us to Neil. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Peter approached me, I, I lost it when I saw that clip. He approached me with a vision of doing these things not for people, for animals. And then I was struck in the history of the internet. This is what the internet looked like when it was born. And you can call that the internet of middle-aged white men. Mostly middle-aged white men. <laughs> um. <laughs> Speaking as one. Yeah. The, then, um, when I first came to TED, which is where I met Peter, I showed this. This is a $1 web server, and at the time that was radical. And the possibility of making a web server for a dollar uh, grew into what became known as the Internet of Things, which is literally an industry now with tremendous implications for um, healthcare, energy efficiency. And we were happy with ourselves. And then when Peter showed me that, I realized we had missed something, which is the rest of the planet. 
So we started up this interspecies internet project. Now we started talking with Ted about how you bring dolphins and great apes and elephants to Ted, and we realized that wouldn't work. So we're going to bring them, you to them. So if we could switch to the audio from this computer,、um, we've been video conferencing with cognitive animals, and we're going to have each of them just briefly introduce them. And so if we could also have this upgrade. So the first site we're going to meet is Cameron Park Zoo in Waco with orangutans.、Uh, in the daytime they live outside; it's nighttime there now. So can you please go ahead? Hi, hi, I'm Terry Cox, Cameron Park Zoo in Waco, Texas, and with me I have Carajan and May, two of our Bornean orangutans. During the day they have a beautiful, large、um, outdoor habitat, and at night they come into this habitat. Uh, into their night quarters, where they can have a climate-controlled and secure environment to sleep in. We are part of the we participate in the Apps for Apes、um, program, the orangutan outreach, and we use、uh, iPads to help stimulate and enrich the animals, and also help raise awareness for these critically endangered animals. And、um, they share 97 percent of our DNA and are incredibly intelligent. So it's so exciting to think of all the opportunities that we have via technology and the internet to really enrich their lives and open up their world. We're really excited about the possibility of an interspecies internet. And KJ has been enjoying the conference very much. That's great. When we were rehearsing last night, he had fun watching the elephants.、Um, next user group are the dolphins at the National Aquarium. Please go ahead. Good evening. Well, my name is Allison Ginsberg, and we're live in Baltimore at the National Aquarium. Joining me are three of our eight Atlantic bottlenose dolphins: 20-year-old Chesapeake, who was our first dolphin born here, her four-year-old daughter Bailey, and her half-sister, 11-year-old Maya. Here at the National Aquarium, we are committed to excellence in animal care, to research, and to conservation. Dolphins are pretty intrigued as to what's going on here tonight. They're not really used to having cameras here at eight o'clock at night.、Um, in addition, we are very committed to doing different types of research. As Diana mentioned, our animals are involved in many different research studies. Th those are for you. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. And the third user、yeah. group in Thailand is、uh, Think Elephant.、Four. Go ahead, Josh. Four. Hi, my name is Josh Potnik, and I'm with Think Elephants International. And we're here in the Golden Triangle of Thailand with the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation elephants. And、we have 26 elephants here, and our research is focused on the evolution of intelligence with elephants. But our foundation, Think Elephants, is focused on bringing elephants into classrooms around the world virtually, like this, and showing people how incredible these animals are. So we're able to bring the camera right up to the elephants, put food into the elephants' mouths, show people what's going on inside their mouths, and, and show everyone around the world how incredible these animals really are. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Josh. And once again, we've been building great relationships among them just since we've been rehearsing. So at that point, if we can go back to the other computer, we were starting to think about how you integrate the rest of the biomass of the planet into the internet, and we went to the best possible person I can think of, which is Vin Cerf, who、uh, is one of the founders who gave us the internet. Vin. Thank you, Neil. That was beautiful. A long time ago, in a galaxy. Oh, wrong script. Forty <laughs> years ago, Bob Kahn and I did the design of the internet. Thirty years ago, we turned it on. Just last year, we turned on the production internet. You've been using the experimental version for the last thirty years. The production version it uses IP version six. It has 3.4 times 10 to the 38th possible terminations. That's a number only the Congress can appreciate. But it leads to、uh, what is coming next. When Bob and I did this design, we thought we were building a system to connect computers together. What we very quickly discovered is that this was a system for connecting people together. And what you've seen tonight tells you that we should not restrict this network to one species. That these other intelligent Sentient species should be part of the system too.
This is the system as it looks today, by the way. This, isn't just, this is what the internet looks like to a computer that's trying to figure out where the traffic is supposed to go. This is generated by a program that's looking at the connectivity of the internet and how all the various networks are connected together. There are about 400,000 networks interconnected, run independently by 400,000 different operating agencies. And the only reason this works is that they all use the same standard TCP IP protocols. Well, you know where this is headed. The Internet of Things tells us that a lot of computer-enabled appliances and devices are going to become part of this system, too. Appliances that you use around the house, that you use at, at, in your office, that you carry around with yourself or in the car. That's the Internet of Things that's coming. Now, what's important about what these people are doing is that they're beginning to learn how to communicate with species that are not us, but share a common sensory environment. We're beginning to explore what it means to communicate with something that isn't just another person. Well, you can see what's coming next. All kinds of possible sentient beings may be interconnected through the system. I can't wait to see these experiments unfold. What happens after that? Well, let's see. There are machines that need to talk to machines and that we need to talk to. And so as time goes on, we're going to have to learn how to communicate with computers and how to get computers to communicate with us in the way that we're accustomed to, not with keyboards, not with mice, but with speech and gestures and all the natural human language that we're accustomed to. So we'll need something like C3PO to become a translator between ourselves and some of the other machines we live with. Now, there is a project that's underway called the Interplanetary Internet. It's in operation between Earth and Mars. It's operating on the International Space Station. It's part of a spacecraft that's in orbit around the sun that's rendezvoused with two planets. So the interplanetary system is on its way, but there's a last project which the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which funded the original ARPANET, funded the internet, funded the interplanetary architecture, is now funding a project to design a spacecraft to get to the nearest star in 100 years' time. What that means is that what we're learning with these interactions with other species will teach us, ultimately, how we might interact with an alien from another world. I can hardly wait. So first of all, thank you. And I would like to acknowledge that four people who could talk to us for four full days actually managed to stay to four minutes each. And we thank you for that. So a quick, I have so many questions, but um, maybe a few practical things that the audience might want to know. You're launching this idea here at TED. Today. W today, yeah. this is the first time you're talking about it. Tell me a little bit about where you're going to take the idea. What's, what's next? I think we want to uh, engage as many people here as possible in helping us think of smart interfaces that will make all this possible. And just mechanically, there's a 501c3 and web infrastructure and all of that, but it's not quite ready to turn on. So we'll roll that out and contact us if you want the information on it. Right. The idea is this will be a, um, much like the internet functions as a network of networks, which was Vince's core contribution. This will be a wrapper around all of these initiatives that are wonderful individually to link them globally. Right, and do you, do you have a web address that we might look for yet? Shortly. Shortly, we will come back to you on that. Um, and very quickly, um, just to clarify, some people might have looked at the video that you showed and thought, well, that's just a webcam, what's special about it? Maybe you could talk for just a moment about how you want to go past that. So th this is scalable video, video infrastructure, not for a few to a few, but many to many, so that it scales mm -hmm. to symmetrical video sharing and content sharing across these sites up, or on the planet. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of back-end signal processing, not for one to many, but for many to many. Right. And then on a practical level, which technologies are you looking at first? I know you mentioned that a keyboard is a really key part of this. We're trying to develop an interactive touch screen for dolphins. This is sort of a continuation of some of the earlier work. And uh, we just got our first seed money today towards that. So it's our first project. Before right the talk, even. Yeah. Well, well done. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. We've, it's such a delight to have you on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.